Greetings, cousins. How y'all doing? Can you see me? <laughs> of, uh, of the different challenges any of us have at any given time, you might notice I'm a little height challenged. So roll with me here. Oh, OK, great. Is there one under there? Which oh. you can see me better now, right? <laughs> and I can see you too. Now I'm a towering giant, right? <laughs> I'm Naomi Davis, and I come from white gloves and mud. I'm the proud granddaughter of Mississippi sharecroppers, one of the millions who came up south for freedom and economic opportunity. Honored to be here, so grateful to the city of Cleveland for the hospitality and the opportunity to just share with you today and hear back from you what your experiences are here in the age of climate crisis. I come from the underground. I come from light broke in on me by degrees. I come from sweet, sweet potato pie. I come from spinning and salt, and then the British are gone. I come from a world that works for everyone, with no one and nothing left out. I come from start with what's in your hand. And I come from follow the money. I come from a tribe that began in Minter City, Mississippi. Those are my aunts and uncles. That's my granny, my mama, my great granny. And it's not so far as you might understand from a town called Money, a town called Money, Mississippi, where who was slain? Who knows? Emmett Till. And who was Emmett Till, that icon of American history who, with his brutal slaying, helped trigger the change of history with the Civil Rights Movement? And of course, when you're looking at your roots and you're looking where you're coming from, it's going to tell you where you're going. And with Grannynomics, the paradigm we founded, uh, we were looking at uh, the values that guided our transactions and ruled our households when, when small was plenty. And we, and we were bringing that tradition forward. That's the neighborhood where I grew up. It happens to be a mural under a train trestle, not too far from the house where I lived as a little girl. And of course, there you are in your little uh, nuclear community with your nuclear family and your walkable village. And that's actually my church. And that's actually the firehouse that was nearby. And I noticed as I grew that this place where I was raised, where those little dollar signs marching down that top yellow line uh, were the neighbor-owned businesses, and you could buy anything you needed within walking distance. And you can see that the top heart was my home, that middle heart was my church, and that bottom, that bottom heart was my school. And out of that experience, out of this experience, a longing, a despair, a, an aching for uh, the time of 
Martin and Malcolm when I had grown up, when everything was possible, and we had the moral high ground, and we had the organization, and we had the cash flow, and we had the, the, uh, the listening of the world, that we, uh, as time slipped on, had slipped down from that mountaintop. And as a single person not knowing the size of the world and what I could do in a place so large, so complex, so confusing, um, I began doing some research back in the year 2000. And out of that work uh, came to grips with what I considered to be a whole system solution that could be a solution for the whole system problem common to black communities everywhere. And this is the eight principles of green village building. And so we've been um, vetting it, teaching it, sharing it, getting input, coaching, and implementing in our uh, pilot community of West Woodlawn in Chicago since 2011. And it's exciting to me to uh, also um, share with you uh, in a way that maybe you want to look at how the eight principles of green village building uh, might be a grassroots infrastructure that can meet the top down. You guys in uh, Cleveland here are, I think, doing a really strong job in making that meet in the middle, that meet in the middle called the top down and the bottom up collaboration. And so that's what I'm here to learn about from you. In this process of creating these uh, eight principles and teaching them and, 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 and handling them and sharing them, we created, of course, eight programs that we could co-implement. Uh, and um, so each of the principles um, was exemplified by a program that uh, had a synergy one with the other that we could actually in this way we thought organize our square mile and begin to have neighbors take on according to their passion according to their skill what uh, what they thought could make the most difference in the place where they lived and so um, our uh, vision was self-sustaining black communities everywhere, and our mission were these walk to work, walk to shop, walk to learn, walk to play villages, where the local living economy was a, uh, was a greenhouse gas reduction strategy. So it was environment and economy married, and um, the experiment continued to uh, unfold. So um, as we saw the, um, the interplay in the infrastructure, we're thinking, okay, uh, great. Uh, Neighbor-owned businesses, that's going to be an anchor for community wealth building. Neighbor-owned property, uh, business incubators, um, home economics. And, 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 and an elevated form of it, not just that mocking of the Betty Crocker and the Aunt Jemima, but really the art and science of the home, which is, of course, the first economy. And um, the idea that we have household income rising and the circulation of wealth within that walkable village and something that rich and poor, not or, rich and poor. Everybody wants a walkable village. And in that context, here in the age of climate crisis, looking at, you know, how do we transact with one another anymore? Um, we've gone off the gold standard and paper money is yielding to what? Everything is a card now, right? You can go forever anymore without ever handling any cash, but guess what? At the end of the day, the real currency is not, uh, is not what's loaded on that card, it's what you're able to do. So we call skill the new money. And of course, Martha Stewart can do everything, but so can Precious, so can Precious. Because in our communities, we got 
thousands of young ladies who are maybe 300 pounds with a third grade education and three kids, and they're precious to us and have value. What is the currency of the people in the place where you live? And what can you do with your hands? You, you may know the, the genius of the, the Negro Alabama ladies in the quilts of G's Ben. Travel the world, the greatest museums around the globe have hosted it. Who knew? Uh, whether you're growing vegetables or whether you're making rugs or ceramics or whether you're recycling the waste of your community, the skill in your hand, that's what we always want to start with. And of course, if you've heard about or understand anything about the uh, energy descent that we're living in and the transition town movement, you'll also recognize this as an inventory of skill. Okay, what can you do if the truck don't come? Because disruptions of that nature are, of course, predicted. And so that's why we say the question of the century, the question of the century is where is your village? And we have a form here today for you to take away with you to kind of look at, okay, if I, if I am uh, taking the front of this form and I'm mapping out where my house is and then I'm mapping out what are my resources within walking distance, that becomes the framework of what we call at Blacks and Green your walkable village. And then if you notice what's missing and you turn the sheet over and you start dreaming about the place of your, of your heart's desire and really looking to see whether you're willing to be cause in the matter of filling in the blanks, what's missing in your walkable village such that you can what? walk to work, walk to shop, walk to learn, walk to play. Because in, in any self-sustaining place, really this is what you're talking about. How can you take care of your needs, not as an island per se, but as a city of interdependent a whole uh, economies, local living economies. And so I'm gonna show you a little bit about how we took the fourth principle and implemented it in, uh, in West Woodlawn. Uh, we created what we call the West Woodlawn Botanic Garden and Village Farm Initiative. West Woodlawn is Chicago's first black middle class neighborhood, home of Lorraine Hansberry and as you would uh, have it, uh, Emmett Till. And we, and we thought about uh, not just uh, the World War II tradition of the Victory Garden, which was about the time when African Americans started moving into that area of west of the city. They call it the Black Belt. They call it Bronzeville, where the southernmost tip of Bronzeville, that tiny, long strip of land where blacks were segregated into housing when they arrived, starting in uh, 1916, and we're honored to be uh, celebrating the centennial of the Great Migration next year. So we decided we were gonna ask uh, an answer, experiment with four questions. How many households could we feed? How many neighbors could we train and engage? Um, how many jobs or businesses could we create? And how many gallons of stormwater could we divert? And so um, in that process, we, um, we launched our first sustainability teaching garden. We, um, we, we used um, the idea that Bronzeville as an international tourism destination, and it is, and our mayor is focused heavily on how we can create a booming economy in the city of Chicago around tourism. So how can I create a, um, a destination culture in my walkable village that allows people to um, wonder and wander and be enriched. And so we actually created a tour that's actually a book written about our neighborhood, Tight Little Island, and there she goes. That is our Tight Little Island. And if I had a pointer, I'd show you where I live right, where it says Chicago. I live right there at the tip of Washington Park. And the way that we've imagined it 
as a, manage, uh, as a matter of village management, stewardship, um, is, as, is as zones so that we can begin training and engaging neighbors in pods. Right now we're experimenting with pods of three where, um, where they are, are being trained. We had our first three graduates from the Open Lands Tree Keepers course. Um, we just planted uh, 40 trees, 20 fruit and nut trees in our ancestor, Orchard of the Ancestors, 20 in the Parkway. We've got another 20 coming on October 3rd. We are making sure that the green infrastructure of the place where we live is kept whole. Um, so this is what we mean when we kind of talk about the sustainable square mile. Okay, it ain't square but blocks aren't square. And it is just kind of a way of looking at what's a unit of measure? What's a way that citizens and neighbors can manage their place so that they um, are uh, self-actualizing, self-determining? This is another way of looking at it in the context of urban agricultural zones introduced into the city. Another way of looking at it is, uh, is the meat on the bones of, uh, of our cultural tourism destination with uh, those black, uh, the black type shows, the uh, commercial strips and our ideation around how those can uh, be developed. And, uh, and of course, where the environment meets the economy, looking at, okay, what kinds of jobs and businesses would we be creating? And of course, um, what I want to say is, you know, as we go through this um, together today, um, I'm going to be able to share some of these uh, informational slides. We've got some data that I want to share with you, stuff that I'd really uh, be grateful if you would take to heart. As I took to heart in 2011, as a speaker at the first Chicago Ideas Week, and of course, my heroes, Martin and Malcolm. And again, looking at my roots and longing for the best of the past and how to translate that into a future. And a future in the form of a fable is what I unfolded that first uh, afternoon when I presented at Chicago Ideas Week, how Chicago became a city of villages. And I came back from the year 2050 to report how we had gotten over, how we had sort of thrived here in the age of climate crisis. And it was revolving around, again, how about if every household could walk to work, walk to shop, walk to learn, and walk to play? And it, and it incorporated this critically important conversation that mostly America is not having about race, about where you are born and what you inherit. And did you get the black card or did you get the white card? Which lottery ticket did you get and was it a winning ticket from the standpoint of the quality of life that you were going to be uh, living into? Not so much who you were or what you had, but just what you arrived into. And what, uh, what we're looking to share with you is that there's a structural imbalance that African Americans around the world get born into. Okay, and it's what we call the whole system problem common to black communities everywhere. And whether you're in Cleveland or Chicago or Oakland or New Zealand or Japan or Russia or Brazil, you are going to find that when you're this, you have that. It's not a coincidence. And again, we're saying only a whole system solution can transform a whole system problem. And we're saying that as we talk about equity here today, you're not going to have climate justice without economic justice. For example, are you aware that though uh, Africans, Africans and the diaspora of Africa contribute the least to global warming, that we suffer a disproportionate negative impact of the, um, of the effects of global warming? That, uh, that this particular study, uh, which is a 2008 study by Herner and Robinson, is a seminal study. And it's documenting for us 
uh, the data associated with uh, the, uh, the, the disproportionate occurrence of, among other things, asthma in our community, and the loss of school, and the loss of work, and how those uh, emergency room visits, uh, the outcomes there, and the deaths associated with it. Uh, not stuff that we're all, you know, fruit, sweetness and light and happy to talk about, but reality that we have to come to grips with as cousins to each other. And I just wanted to share with you that if you, you know, I never necessarily know how steeped in the environment folks are, even at summits like these, but what's the number 402? Who knows what that is? A hint, PPM, parts per million, 402 parts per million greenhouse gases, we're at the tipping point. We're Bill McKibben and, you know, the IPP, IPCC and Al Gore and that whole, you know, uh, tribe of environmental uh, voices have been telling us and when Blacks and Green was founded in 2007, everyone from corporations to kindergartners all around the world, we were rallying and we were going to bring that 370 parts per million down to what? 350.org, Bill McKibben's organization, y'all familiar? Okay. And what have we done instead? Like a bullet, we've gone in the opposite direction. This is why we talk about green village building. This is why, though we love our legislators, we're not sitting on our hands waiting for them to save us, are we? Can I get an amen, y'all? Okay, you're out there. I hear you. And 739 is the number of mostly uh, African Americans, many seniors who died in the heat wave of 1995 in the city of Chicago. And what does it teach us? What does it teach us about sustainability and survival here in the age of climate crisis? I'll tell you what it teaches you. That as of Sergeant Vincent Davis, an internationally renowned emergency management expert, has told us from one side of the globe to the other. When it hits, it's not your cans of meat and it's not your cases of water that are gonna save you. It's what? It's your network of relationships. It's who you know. It's who you show up as missing for. Oh, where's Miss Ann? She's usually down here on Wednesdays to play checkers or whatever. Do you show up missing for anyone in your world if, if you just don't um, get out of bed that day? And so that kind of isolation in these urban environments, doesn't matter how dense you build it, if you don't know nobody, okay? So we're just saying, this is the time that we're living in. We're living in a time when races are not talking, when elders are isolated, and when we just really don't know our neighbors. And so at Blacks and Green, we have this, we have this uh, initiative where we're literally calling our children home. Come on back to the hood. We know why you went to the suburbs. We get it. We do. But you know what? Here in the age of climate crisis, you're going to want to be able to walk to work, walk to shop, walk to learn, walk to play. And so we've created uh, here in our uh, year one of the next seven years a real estate development initiative. And we are just beginning to um, actualize in bricks and mortar what we've been talking about in philosophy and programmatically for these last seven years. And we're so excited. We have our first two properties under contract now. And they will exemplify the urban homestead, the conservation lifestyle, what Granny would call the beautiful life. I grew up hearing the stories of churning butter on the porch and playing a musical instrument, and that was, that was entertainment, y'all. <laughs> 
And um, so it doesn't take much for us to be happy, but it does take a lot of structure sometimes for us to be healthy. This is a, an example of our Institute for Community Control Development, where we're just looking to put together a technical assistance pool of a spectrum of real estate professionals. Why? Because we are understanding that in the inner city is gold. That's right. This lot across the street from our headquarters, my apartment, apartment on the third floor, offices on the first floor, uh, was vacant for 30 years. And, and, and hundreds and thousands of these vacant lots are now found along with boarded, vacant, abandoned properties in West Woodlawn due to what? The foreclosure tsunami and other targeted um, atrocities, okay? This is what we made of it. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Start with what's in your hand. We didn't have a thin dime when we declared that we would create that sustainability teaching garden, okay? And just again, to put it in context for you, you see the little heart there, that's at the foot of Washington Park. Some of you may have heard the Presidential Center is coming to town, all right? <laughs> and it's either gonna come to that park that says Washington Park or that park that says Jackson Park. And right there smack dab in the middle is what? The University of Chicago, a beautiful place literally and figuratively, but guess what? Also a land baron. Are you hearing me? Is it reminding you of anything? Okay, so I just wanna say, and that beautiful gentleman down there, he is uh, President Obama's uh, very close friend and the chairman of his foundation, and in the conversation for how do we take this Winning lottery ticket, Chicago won the lottery ticket, okay? How do we take this moment in time and use it to level the playing field, to create community wealth? We're talking about a structured dialogue for, co for community benefits. What would a community benefits agreement look like in the context of blight and beauty? And our beloved uh, Obama Foundation representative says, well, the whole thing is a community benefit. And we say, community benefits are negotiated. They are not declared. And I just want to say that in the context of negotiating, how many of you know there's a hunger strike in Chicago by the Diet 12 who are protesting putting their lives on the line. What do you stand for? What do you care about? What are you willing to die for? Anything? Find something that, gee, well, maybe I'd be willing to give my life for that. That's, that's a pretty exciting idea for me, although, you know, we all want to live. But those 12 people are on a strike because Chicago Public School, famous throughout the land for its mismanagement, I'm sorry, has unilaterally declared that they're going to close these number of schools, that they're going to reopen which ones, that they're, the schools they reopen are going to be X, Y, and Z. Damn the community conversation. Damn the self-determination. And so we're just saying, here in the age of climate crisis, relationship is more important than ever, and we're going to need to find different ways to talk one to each other. So we created a Bronzeville Regional Collective. There we are. We had our first press conference a few months ago. We sent in our proposal to the Obama Foundation asking for s seven basic things. And um, those, uh, you probably, no, you can't read them. But um, again, these are documents that we can make available to anyone who wants to begin to study. Well, gee, um, how, what's relevant? What's the process of a community benefits agreement? Well, we studied. We studied the uh, West Harlem Agreement, we studied the Minneapolis Ordinance, we studied 
the, um, the Oakland model. We, we, we've done a lot of studying. We studied the Chicago Olympics model, okay? And so we're, we're saying that because it's the opportunity to create unparalleled community wealth, let's do it. Are you, the first question of which, though, is are you, whoever the you is, whoever's that person you're looking at, whoever you're negotiating with, are you committed to creating community wealth? Because if you're not, it's good for me to know. Then I know how to talk to you. And if you are, fabulous. We're going to get this thing done. And so here we are pushing this message. We just had our third annual uh, Green Village Pavilion at the African Festival of the Arts, the largest neighborhood festival in Chicago. And there we are again at the table talking about community benefits agreements. Yes, it's a festival with music and dancing and shopping and all of those things, but also with an oasis for people to sit and share and think and eat, break bread together. So we're sharing that with you as a way to encourage you to look at the many ways that you can dig deep and talk about and tool yourself up and learn about what's going to work here in the age of climate crisis when relationship is more important than anything else ever has been, okay? This is a very important study that talks about race-based wealth disparity. People, it's real. It's not that black people are just stupid and lazy. It really isn't. And, um, and just because we're paranoid doesn't mean they're not really after us. Um, so I just wanted to share with you that we are analyzing the source of this disparity. And guess what? The, the home, home ownership, figures centrally into that proposition of equity. How do, we, how do we share, how do we build wealth in the, in, 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 in the place we call America? Many of us do it uh, through the um, ownership of, uh, of land. And of course, where land is concerned, can scandal be far behind? Because in uh, uh, the great city of Chicago, uh, on the south and west sides, which are the historically uh, African-American community or enclaves, great improprieties, great moral vicissitudes, um, a great taking happen. And, uh, and uh, you know, you can study the facts and you can calculate the numbers of how, um, how you know, stealing a million dollars a week out of the equity that a person is entitled to could, over time, um, reach hundred, uh, over a hundred billion dollars. I mean, it's real, it's calculable, and it matters that it was lost. That was a, uh, a workshop that we did back in 2010. And so there are solutions. And uh, again, we're studying, we're looking at the things that you can do uh, in a neighborhood to help advance uh, neighbor investors. We want homeowners and we want neighbor investors. As a matter of equity, how do we make sure that that kind of thing is happening? Again, we have studied different models. Um, a lot of really good work has been done. You don't have to reinvent the wheel for the most part. had referred to the West Harlem Community Benefits Agreement, Columbia University. Do you have universities here in Cleveland who are large institutions acquiring large clusters and assembling great parcels of land? Is it happening in an equitable way? Harlem used to be 90% black, now it's 30% black. Where shall the people go? Does it matter? This is my neighborhood, West Woodlawn, tearing down a perfectly fine six flat, a beautifully solid, elegant building, 
um, as a solution to what? Drug dealing. How are we thinking about our solutions together? And so as we do think about our solutions, I'm asking for folks to look at what is going to level the playing field. The main ingredient is always going to be ownership. Ownership of the land, ownership of the businesses. There is no substitute. And when we, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a, a really, I'm going to give you a cliche here. My best friend is white. <laughs> Not even a little snicker. Okay. And um, she's a skinny little farmer girl, okay? And this is her company where she works, Angelic Organics Learning Center. And I am so proud of the work that they've been doing and looking at how to be an ally with others, in quotations, the other, the other type of person, the other neighborhood. Um, and when we look at privilege, um, they've done deep tissue analysis and study. And so we make this document available to you too, so that you can understand that, okay, I get it, you didn't own any slaves. You really didn't. but you inherited something that you didn't earn. And so the opportunity to look straight in the face of disproportionate negative impacts like gentrification and how we're defining it is when the bottom tier of homes where value is concerned rises to the top tier of homes where value is concerned. Look at how it's going across America. Boston, Seattle, 55%. New York, 46%. San Francisco, 42%. DC, 35%. And these statistics